Nazis. He wasn't really a big hit and he definitely wasn't burning up the air place. And they were promptly dropped by Parlophone. Fortunately, a talent scout from record label Decca happened to be in the right place at the right time. Frank Rogers came over from Decca and he was looking for talent, music talent in Ireland. So we ended up going to this club in Dublin called uh, Dr. Shivargo's, I think it was. And we were just in the background, myself, Philip and Bran. And Frank Rogers and one of our managers at that point was standing on the empty dance floor, looking up at us on the stage. And after that, Frank Rogers came over to us and said, um, I'm very impressed with, with the band, and um, would, you like a, would you like a recording contract with Decca, you know? And we went, you know, you're joking, basically. So about a week later, we were on the boat to London. I'm Joe John, putting his trousers on. I gotta get out of here. I hear your lover's footsteps, uh, it's coming to near for me, my dear. Not only was Phil a highly gifted songwriter, musician and vocalist, both on and off the stage, he was admired for his ultra-cool demeanor and genuine style. Making love against the wild. I thought I was a cool dresser, but I mean, he was so much cooler always, so I'd nick some of his clothes or he'd give me some of his clothes to wear, you know what I mean? What I loved was walking into a room with him because, I mean, he, he walked into a room, the whole place came alive. It wasn't because I walked into a room. <laughs> you only had to look at him, really, and you could see he's a rock star. My dress sense was dreadful. Most people's was in the 70s, but uh, he had a certain thing about him. Image was a big thing with Phil, big thing. And that carried on into the music as well. He always had a nice way of uh, being able to get clothes off the girls. One way or the other, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> I like that top. <laughs> and so he was able to, you know, he got a fair few things like that that he would wear. No problem, you know, he just adapted them. And Phil was well into clothes. He loved clothes. And um, he'd be going, oh, look at that, man. Look. Look at the trousers your man is on, you know, look at those boots, look at that jacket. And we'd end up going around all these shops and Dandelion Market and all with Philip, who buys like tons of secondhand clothes. You, you had that thing, you know, when you, you, either, you can't teach it to somebody, you either have it or you don't have it. And he had it. <laughs> March 1972, Thin Lizzy were invited to support Slade on their UK tour. Slade was just the biggest thing in the country then. They were just enormous. I think the first or second night we played, we didn't know what to expect. We walked on and the place was stuffed. I mean, there was like, it looked like thousands upon thousands of people. And we walked on and <laughs> we never really thought about it and just played and played the same set as what we would play in a pub and we just died to death. The, the audience were just going, we want Slade, we want Slade. Slade were managed by ex-Animals bass player, Chaz Chandler, the man who discovered Jimi Hendrix. After we finished our set, we went into the changing room and Chaz Chandler came in and he says, right boys, if that's what your show is like, you're off the tour. He says, we didn't bring you on to send the audience to sleep. If you don't get it together, you're off. And Phil just went. The guy was devastated, you know. And he was on the point of crying because this was his hero's manager was telling him that we were basically no good. The next night, God love Philip, I, I looked over at him every now and again, he would throw this ship, you know. He'd be at the front with a bass for about four seconds and then he'd go, and I go back to being shy Philip. <laughs> and then about three minutes later, he would do another one, and which lasts for about five seconds. And then he'd go back again to being shy Philip. He started very gradually checking the audience out and feeling more at home with them and realizing, God, I did this pose and nobody threw anything at me. Phil wasn't a particularly confident front man at the beginning, which is quite hard to believe now. By the end, there were very few people that, that could work an audience quite the way that Phil could. 
there's loads of people who can play exceptionally well and like that little thing that takes them to the next point. And when he got confident, you know, the whole world was there for him. But he had a hunger to want everybody to know him or to know his work and his music and the band. And, I mean, we got pretty close, I think. <laughs> he used to come up to stage and say to me, how do you think it looked? You know, what do you think of the shapes? You go, brilliant. I mean, he just knew how to do that. For a bass player to sing and to throw shapes like that, everyone has copied him since. Everyone. Sin Lizzy's first hit single came about through a mixture of luck and perversity. The original A-side, Black Boys on the Corner, was penned by Phil and he felt it was hit material. For the B-side, they recorded a rock version of the old Gaelic folk song, Whiskey in the Jar. Phil took the unprecedented step of recording this track with no bass line. I was very young. You know, I was a very young producer. I was green. And we just weren't getting the vibe. So Phil was turned around and said, look, let's just do it live like we do on stage. And uh, Eric said, well, why not? You know, it, it doesn't, won't do any harm. And they did it in one take. And that's, that's actually the take that went out. And it's just magic. Against Phil's wishes, Decca flipped the sides and the single Whiskey in the Jar shot to number six in the UK charts. Yes, I was going over the park and carry mountains. So I kept him fair on and his money. He was counting. I first produced my pistol. Then produced my radio. I say. The first time the hair stood out on the back of my neck was when I saw uh, Thin Lizzy on um, Top of the Pops with Whiskey in a Jar. When Whiskey in a Jar became a hit, Philip completely realised, my God, I have went from the back streets of Dublin to be on Top of the Pops, you know, waving out at all the guys in Dublin that used to think I was a nut or a total time waster or a dreamer. I've actually made it come true. Whiskey in a Jar, I mean, every time it comes on, you just can't help singing along. Till this day, Whiskey in the Jar could be one of the two biggest songs in Ireland, and the other is the national anthem. <laughs> I mean, it is one of the finest rock tracks of that period. I know he rocked up a beautiful old Irish ballad, but funnily enough, I don't know how to put it. He, he loved his other stuff better. Phil never did things by half. He lived life at a pace that astounded those who knew him. He'd be going day and night. So whatever it took to keep him going day and night, he would take to go day and night. He didn't want to sleep. He didn't want to stop. He, he never relaxed. He, ne he never slept much. Philip had an addictive personality. He had the constitution of an ox. He was Johnny the Fox. He just, whatever he did, whatever Philip did, he did it big time. He was a big drinker. I drink brandy. He could drink a bottle while I was having two glasses, you know what I mean? Yeah, I couldn't keep up with him. He was, he was unbelievable. Many a time I've ended up not being able to walk with Phil just standing there going, what's the matter? He, used to, he had hollow legs, I'm sure. Well, the nights out we had, and we had many, uh, basically, by the end of it, we couldn't remember <laughs> whether we had a good night or a bad night. We just went out and got totally wasted. <laughs> But it was just, uh, that's what we did. We just went out. It was just great company. He just liked partying, to be perfectly honest. Oh, he believed he was immortal, certainly. He believed nothing could ever happen to him, but that's a very Irish characteristic. After the huge success of Whiskey in the Jar, Phil and his band found themselves under increasing pressure. I noticed when Whiskey in the Jar came out that things started changing dramatically. We are starting to get pressure then from the record company you know, we want another hit, lads, or you're going to be a one-hit wonder. And I was told one night, after we'd come off the stage, I was told, Eric, uh, the guitar solos are too long. You're boring the audience to death. And I'm going, what? I said, you stick to your effing office and, and 
stick to the phone. You know, I don't come in and tell you how to talk on the phone. Don't tell me how to play the guitar. The pressure was to be compounded by Phil's ever-present search for musical perfection. He was pragmatic when he thought that's as far as he could go or that was the best he could do at the time, but he was definitely a perfectionist. He always was striving to do better with his music and with his performance and with the band. And You know, he, was, he always thought that there was more to be had. Work was difficult because we, we were all sort of perfectionists and it, you'd only have to make one little mistake to get it in the neck. <laughs> I always left the dressing room at least 10 minutes before we went on and as I closed the door you could hear the roars, somebody getting a rollick in and sorting out something that happened wrong on the show before, you know. Verbally we would throw it back and forth and so I learnt a lot but the initial uh, thing of him being right all the time. Hated it. Because I'm right all the time. But we kind of went like that, and so I'd learnt a lot, and I took on a lot of his traits without really knowing it. You know, he was tough. He didn't suffer fools gladly. You know, if you, if you went down the wrong road with Phil, he would say so. But he was, not in, he was not intimidating, and he was not cruel, and he was not mean. He just wanted to get the job done. Thin Lizzy's future now seemed assured. The next album was to be Vagabonds of the Western World. It wasn't until Vagabonds that they started to become Thin Lizzy, the famous Thin Lizzy that everyone knew and loved. We released the third single, The Rocker, and we all thought that was going to take off. And it didn't. Um, it got somewhere in the top 40, but it didn't become a hit. And that's when the change started really happening. Philip then, he, he was hungry for the top of the pops, the adulation, the hit again. You know, he wanted that again. When Vagabond sold poorly, Thin Lizzy were unceremoniously dropped by Decca. The strain was beginning to take its toll on Eric Bell. I got into this sort of lifestyle, you know, as bands do, and I, I couldn't stop drinking. I don't think I was straight one night <laughs> in three years, and I kept thinking, Jesus, man, what, what's going on here, you know? How have you got a bit of a problem? Uh, like I couldn't stop drinking and then I needed, even though it was only a hash, I needed it to play. And that's one of the reasons I left and um, myself and Philip had a fight, you know, the first fight we ever had. We had it in this horrible tour we did in Germany and things between us were a bit sort of tense after that, you know. Eric quit the band. I was so proud of Thin Lizzy and being in it, but um, I just kept toying with the idea, I'm going to leave, you know, I've got to get out of here, you know, it's, it's not going the way I want anymore. I've been there and I've done that and I got the straight jacket. It seemed Thin Lizzy would be consigned to the one-hit wonder bin, but for someone as determined as Philip, giving up was not an option. He recruited 20-year-old Scott Garham and the 17-year-old Brian Robbo Robertson and the mighty and unforgettable powerhouse that was Thin Lizzy was reborn. Right there out of the blue. I said, hey baby, meet me. 